Hi history lovers and welcome or welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every Friday on all aspects of history. Today on History Calling we're looking at the first flight ever of what is considered to be the first airplane in the world. This incredible invention was created by two American brothers, Wilbur and Orville Wright, at the start of the 20th century and it paved the way for commercial air travel and ultimately the world's space programs. But how do you build a plane when no one has ever seen one before and how do you launch it when airports and runways don't exist yet? In this video, you'll learn how the Wrights managed this incredible feat, discover what happened during their previous attempts to fly, and hear how some dodgy equations nearly scuppered their plans. You'll see one of the most famous photographs in history of the moment modern aviation took off, and hear one of the brothers describe the events of that day in his diary. Stay till the end and I'll tell you how parts of their original aircraft have even ended up on the moon and on Mars. Before we get going, I'll just squeeze in the standard YouTuber request to please like this video, subscribe to the channel with notifications switched on, and check out my Instagram, which I'll leave a link to in the description box. Airplanes were not humanity's initial attempt at air travel. The first hot air balloon flight with humans on board was made in October 1783 in France, and there have been experiments with gliders in the 19th century. Neither of these two forms of aviation fulfil the requirements of a plane, however, which needs to be a powered, heavier-than-air aircraft under human control and capable of sustaining flight. A glider doesn't have its own power source, while a hot air balloon is lighter than air rather than heavier. Neither can provide the level of human control an aircraft can either. Humans therefore remain severely limited in what they could achieve with regards to airborne travel. On the 16th of April 1867, the first of two men who would change all of this was born. This was Wilbur Wright, who came into the world near the town of Millville, Indiana. He was joined in 1871 by his brother Orville, born in Dayton, Ohio, where the family ultimately settled in 1884. As teenagers and adults, the brothers worked first in the printing industry, publishing a number of short-lived newspapers. Then, from 1893 onwards, they moved into bicycle manufacture and repair, a job which overlapped with their printing business for the first six years and which gave them many of the technical skills they would later employ in the creation of the first airplane. The Wright brothers had had an interest in aeronautics since childhood. Then, in 1899, Wilbur wrote this letter to the Smithsonian Institution to ask to be sent any scholarship already published on the topic. Dated the 30th of May, it says, I have been interested in the problem of mechanical and human flight ever since, as a boy, I constructed a number of bats of various sizes after the style of Cayley's and Pinode's machines. My observations since have only convinced me more firmly that human flight is possible and practicable. It is only a question of knowledge and skill, just as in all acrobatic feats. Birds are the most perfectly trained gymnasts in the world and are specially well fitted for their work, and it may be that man will never equal them. But no one who has watched a bird chasing an insect or another bird can doubt that feats are performed which require three or four times the effort required in ordinary flight. I believe that simple flight at least is possible to man, and that the experiments and investigations of a large number of independent workers will result in the accumulation of information and knowledge and skill which will finally lead to accomplished flight. The works on the subject to which I have had access are Mary's and Jameson's books published by Appleton's and various magazines and cyclopedic articles. I am about to begin a systematic study of the subject in preparation for practical work to which I expect to devote what time I can spare from my regular business. I wish to obtain such papers as the Smithsonian Institution has published on this subject, and if possible a list of other works in print in the English language. I am an enthusiast but not a crank, in the sense that I have some pet theories as to the proper construction of a flying machine. I wish to avail myself of all that is already known and then, if possible, add my might to help on the future workers who will attain final success. I do not know the terms on which you send out your publications, but if you will inform me of the cost, I will remit the price. Having done their research, really these are men after my own heart, 
The Wrights set about creating their own flying machine by building on previous experiments done by others on gliders and by applying what they had learned from working on bicycles about the importance of balance. They invented a system they called wing warping to allow the wings to be moved so that the airflow and therefore the lift over them could be controlled. At first they practiced this on a kite, which they made themselves in 1899. However, no photograph of this device survives. Soon they moved on to creating gliders, which would eventually be able to carry humans. There are photos of those. Here we see a glider created by the Wrights in 1900, still being flown as a kite. By making modifications to the shape of the wings and to the way in which air flew over them was controlled, they were creating ever more sophisticated crafts. This one had a wingspan of 5.2 metres and weighed 24 kilograms, but because of problems obtaining the correct wood for the frame, it was smaller than the brothers wanted, with a wing area of 15 square metres covered with one layer of French sateen fabric. But where do you test gliders and ultimately aircraft when airports and runways don't exist yet? The Wrights settled on fields near Kitty Hawk in North Carolina, with wide open spaces, good winds and sand for soft landings. Though not that soft, as you can see here in an image of the glider after it was picked up and thrown down by the wind on the appropriately named Hill of the Wreck. Given how exposed to the elements it was, the area could be bleak, and the brothers and the friends who assisted them were often sandblasted and covered in mosquito bites. Still, they continued to visit from Ohio and make test flights on Kill Devil Hills outside of Kitty Hawk. They created a second glider in 1901, bigger than the 1900 version, with a wing area of 26.9 square metres, and which used muslin instead of sateen to cover the wings. Soon they were making manned flights, but this glider did not have the improved lift they were hoping for and it was harder to control than its predecessor. It was back to the drawing board. The equations the Wrights had been using to calculate things like lift and drag were based on the work of others rather than their own experiments, so now they set out to test the veracity of the data by using model wings set up in a miniature wind tunnel which you can see a replica of here. They soon discovered serious flaws in the equations and set about correcting them. With their new and improved maths, real progress could be made and a third glider was built. The 1902 glider flew much better than its predecessors. It had different proportions with longer, narrower wings and this greatly improved its lift. A new mobile rudder which operated in tandem with the wing warping technology also enhanced its controllability. Using this glider, the brothers made between 700 and 1,000 glides in the autumn of 1902, climbing as high as 600 feet. There was only one thing left to do, create a powered airplane. During 1903, back home in Ohio, the brothers calculated how big their intended aircraft would need to be to support the weight of an engine, propellers and a person, how the weight would be distributed and how this would affect the proportions of the different parts of what they called the flyer. Then they built it. Unlike the gliders which came before it and which the Wright brothers took no care to preserve, the first ever airplane still exists and can now be visited in the Air and Space Museum in Washington DC. This means that we can see exactly what it looked like without having to rely on early 20th century photography, although the wings have been recovered since 1903, so this isn't the original fabric. According to the museum's website, the specifications of the first flyer, also known as the Kitty Hawk flyer and the Wright flyer, are as follows. The wingspan is 12.3 metres with an area of 47.4 square metres. The flyer is 6.4 metres long, 2.8 metres high and weighed 341 kilograms with the pilot on board. No one could make an engine small enough or light enough for the Wright brothers' needs, so as with the flyer, they created their own. This petrol or gas powered four cylinder water cooled engine was basic, but it produced 12 horsepower, which was above the minimum of eight they needed. The two propellers were eight feet long and made of spruce wood. A stopwatch and anemometer on the flyer would allow time and distance of flight to be recorded, from which airspeed could then be deduced. Remember when I said that no airports or runways existed yet? Well, this now became a problem, as the flyer was too heavy to be launched by hand in the way that the gliders had been. 
This necessitated the building of the 60 foot long launching track you see here. The flyer could be placed on the track on a wheel dolly which it could roll down in order to launch. According to the caption on this photo, the craft had to be dragged into position from the nearby shed in which it was stored with the help of four men from the Kill Devil Hills Life Saving Station along with two small boys and a dog. There was a failed attempt by Wilbur to fly on the 14th of December which ended after three and a half seconds when the flyer stalled while still on the launching track and came off it into the sand. Repairs were made and three days later it was time to make history. At 10.35 a.m. on the 17th of December 1903, Orville took off in the flyer, lying almost flat against it to reduce drag caused by his body. He travelled for 12 seconds, landing some 120 feet away. Modern aviation had been born. This famous photograph of the first flight was taken by the Wright's friend John T. Daniels and shows Wilbur running next to the plane. The day of the first flight was also the day of the second, third and fourth, as the brothers took turns trying out their new invention. The final one, with Wilbur back at the controls, was the most impressive. 852 feet in 59 seconds. Later that day, Orville sent his father a telegram telling him of their achievement. It read, and the spelling and grammatical errors and inaccurate length of the fourth flight are in the original document. Success. Four flights Thursday morning, all against 21 mile wind. Started from level with engine power alone. Average speed through air, 31 miles. Longest, 57 seconds. Inform press, home Christmas. Orville Wright. In his diary that night, he described in much greater detail what had occurred. When we got up, a wind of between 20 and 25 miles was blowing from the north. We got the machine out early and put out the signal for the men at the station. Before we were quite ready, John T. Daniels, W. S. Dow, A. D. Etheridge, W. C. Brinkley of Manteo and Johnny Moore of Nags Head arrived. After running the engine and propellers a few minutes to get them in working order, I got on the machine at 10.35 for the first trial. The wind, according to our anemometers at this time, was blowing a little over 20 miles, corrected 27 miles according to the government anemometer at Kitty Hawk. On slipping the rope, the machine started off, increasing in speed to probably 7 or 8 miles. The machine lifted from the truck just as it was entering on the fourth reel. Mr. Daniels took a picture just as it left the tracks. I found the control of the front rudder quite difficult on account of its being balanced too near the centre and thus had a tendency to turn itself when started so that the rudder was turned too far on one side and then too far on the other. As a result, the machine would rise suddenly to about 10 feet and then as suddenly, on turning the rudder, dart for the ground. A sudden dart when out about 100 feet from the end of the tracks ended the flight. Time, about 12 seconds, not known exactly as watch was not promptly stopped. The lever for throwing off the engine was broken and the skid under the rudder cracked. After repairs, at 20 minutes after 11 o'clock, Will, meaning his brother Wilbur, made the second trial. The course was about like mine, up and down but a little longer over the ground, though about the same in time. Distance not measured but about 175 feet. Wind speed not quite so strong. With the aid of the station men present, we picked the machine up and carried it back to the starting ways. At about 20 minutes till 12 o'clock, I made the third trial. When out about the same distance as Will's, I met with a strong gust from the left which raised the left wing and sidled the machine off to the right in a lively manner. I immediately turned the rudder to bring the machine down and then worked the end control. Much to our surprise, on reaching the ground, the left wing struck first showing the lateral control of this machine much more effective than on any of our former ones. At the time of its sidling, it had raised to a height of probably 12 to 14 feet. At just 12 o'clock, Will started on the fourth and last trip. The machine started off with its ups and downs as it had before, but by the time he had gone over three or 400 feet, he had it under much better control and was traveling on a fairly even course. It proceeded in this manner till it reached a small hummock out about 800 feet from the starting ways, when it began its pitching again and suddenly darted into the ground. The front rudder frame was badly broken up, but the main frame suffered none at all. The distance over the ground was 852 feet in 59 seconds. 
The engine turns was 1071, but this included several seconds while on the starting ways and probably about a half second after landing. The jar of landing had set the watch on machine back, so that we have no exact record for the 1071 turns. Will took a picture of my third flight just before the gust struck the machine. The machine left the way successfully at every trial, and the tail was never caught by the truck as we had feared. After removing the front rudder, we carried the machine back to camp. We set the machine down a few feet west of the building, and while standing about discussing the last flight, a sudden gust of wind struck the machine and started to turn it over. All rushed to stop it. Will, who was near one end, ran to the front, but too late to do any good. Mr. Daniels and myself seized spars at the rear, but to no purpose. The machine gradually turned over on us. Mr. Daniels, having had no experience in handling a machine of this kind, hung on to it from the inside, and as a result was knocked down and turned over and over with it as it went. His escape was miraculous, as he was in with the engine and chains. The engine legs were all broken off, the chain guides badly bent, a number of uprights and nearly all the rear ends of the ribs were broken. One spar only was broken. After dinner, we went to Kitty Hawk to send off Telegram to MW. That's their father and refers to the Telegram you heard a couple of minutes ago. John T. Daniels really had been incredibly lucky not to be seriously injured when the flyer was damaged, but we can tell from a letter written 30 years later that he rather enjoyed being, as he called it, the first aeroplane casualty in the world, and he kept the piece of the upright that I was holding on to when it fell. I'll leave a link to his eyewitness account of the first flight in the description box. Despite the note in the telegram telling their father to inform the press that they would be home at Christmas, the brothers seem to have changed their minds about speaking to reporters. However, on the 5th of January 1904, after they had returned to Ohio, they nevertheless released a statement to the Associated Press in which they said, it had not been our intention to make any detailed public statement concerning the private trials of our power flyer on the 17th of December last. But since the contents of a private telegram announcing to our folks at home the success of our trials was dishonestly communicated to the newspaper men at the Norfolk office and led to the imposition upon the public by persons who never saw the flyer or its flights of a fictitious story incorrect in almost every detail, and since this story, together with several pretended interviews or statements, which were fakes pure and simple, have been very widely disseminated, we feel impelled to make some correction. They then gave a detailed account of the first flight, adding towards the end of their statement that they knew that the age of the flying machine had come at last. Now they had to show that their new invention could be better manoeuvred, and so two new flyers were made in 1904 and 1905 and flown out of the field you see here called Huffman Priory near Dayton, Ohio, to avoid the lengthy trips to North Carolina. On the 20th of September 1904, they were able to make a circular flight lasting 96 seconds and over a distance of 4,080 feet. A year later, in October 1905, they could fly for 39 minutes, covering a distance of over 24 miles. The Wright brothers would go on to receive the patent for their invention in 1906, though it actually referred to one of their gliders rather than the final plane as they had submitted it back in March 1903. Having kept their work relatively secret, however, other would-be aviators were garnering more attention than they, and it took public flights by Wilbur in France and elsewhere in Europe in 1908 and 1909 to make the truth that they had invented the first recognisable aircraft widely known. They became instant celebrities the world over, though they had to fight constant patent infringement cases against others copying their work until the US government forced all patents to effectively become merged during World War I. There was also tragedy. When Orville was conducting flight trials for the Army in the United States on the 17th of September 1908, the plane crashed. Though he survived, the Army observer with him, Lieutenant Thomas E. Selfridge, died becoming the first ever modern aviation death. Nevertheless, after other, much more successful trials, the Army did purchase the Wright brothers' plane for $30,000. Sadly, Wilbur would not have long to enjoy his newfound wealth, fame, and acclaim. He died in Dayton of typhoid fever on the 30th of May, 1912, aged 45. Orville retired from aviation three years later and lived until 1948, dying of a heart attack at the age of 76. 
He had lived long enough to see his own and his brother's invention change the world. For once the nut of how to create controlled, powered and sustainable flight was cracked, progress in the industry moved at an exponential rate. Though neither brother saw it, just 66 years after that first 12 second flight, humans went to the moon on Apollo 11. They took with them a small piece of the original 1903 flyer. On the 19th of April 2021, another tiny piece of the craft was flown around on Mars on the helicopter Ingenuity. It was the first ever powered, controlled flight on another planet, and I'll leave a link to footage of the event in the description box. Indeed, today, an existence without aviation is unimaginable. Whether used for travel or to transport goods such as food, medicine and clothing, there is barely a human alive who has not been affected in some way by the existence of airplanes, even if they have never been on one. At Kill Devil Hill, where the first flight took off, there is a memorial to the men who made it happen and their achievement is celebrated every year there on the 17th of December. I hope you've enjoyed this look back at the birth of modern aviation. If you'd like to learn more about the Wrights and their journey towards inventing the world's first functioning aircraft, the Air and Space Museum have a great online exhibition which has been my main source for this video and which I'll leave linked below. Let me know in the comments section what you think the best and or worst result of the invention of the airplane is. And please remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel. I'll be back next week with a new video and until then, keep learning.